We are an island. To our knowledge, we are the sole inhabitants of this vast universe. We have been searching for aliens for about as long as we've been able to search, but with no luck. Until we find some definite biological signature on Mars, or a radio signal that is unarguably from another civilization, or a single cell from a moon around Jupiter or Saturn, life to our knowledge remains an anomaly unique to Earth and we can only imagine what life elsewhere in the universe could look like. The following video series will outline the natural history of a number of fictional alien planets. I hope you'll join me as I introduce Project Rose. Our fictional system will be based on the TRAPPIST-1 system. The red dwarf star TRAPPIST-1 has seven known planets orbiting it. These planets orbit their stars so close that it is believed that they are all tidally locked. Tidal locking is when one side of a planet faces its star all the time. However, TRAPPIST-1 is dim enough so that three of these seven close planets are in the habitable zone. The habitable zone is the area around a star where it is most likely for liquid water to exist. In our solar system, Earth and Mars are in this zone. Since TRAPPIST-1 has three planets in the habitable zone, three planets have potential for harboring life similar to Earth. Not much is known about the TRAPPIST-1 planets outside of their masses and their radii. TRAPPIST-1's extreme distance from Earth makes it hard to get any idea of the planet's composition without more advanced instruments. Obviously, this video is not about TRAPPIST and its planets. This is an introduction to a thought experiment. The question being how might life evolve on planets in a red dwarf system similar to TRAPPIST-1? TRAPPIST-1 will serve as a blueprint for a hypothetical system. We will need to change some things about the planets to give them the best possible chance to harbor life. The star will remain the same, but we will change the name of our theoretical star to Roseus to differentiate between the real system and our imaginary one. We will keep the three innermost worlds, the equivalents of TRAPPISTs B, C, and D, the exact same. We will name them Balbinus, Kalaha, and Scorpios, all named after Roman generals. These planets are not in the habitable zone, and thus won't be changed. Planets E, F, and G are in the habitable zone, so this is where the most changes will be made. The equivalent of TRAPPIST-1e will be named Nusku in our fictional system, named after the Mesopotamian god of fire. Nusku will retain the radius of its TRAPPIST counterpart at 0.918 Earth radii. However, it needs a little more mass to support nitrogen in its atmosphere. We will put it at 0.71 Earth masses. As a result, the gravity will be 84% that of Earth. It will also have a moon with 2% the mass of Nusku itself. The moon will be named Enki, after Nusku's sibling and the god of wisdom in Mesopotamian mythology. This moon will not change the fact that this planet is tidally locked, and will always have one side in perpetual daytime and one side in perpetual nighttime. This could be a problem for life. The temperature on the day side could get incredibly hot, and the temperature on the night side could get incredibly cold, leaving the only habitable space on a small strip of land between the two extremes. This system would be incredibly unstable over geological timescales. However, if a large enough atmosphere or ocean is present, the fluid could dissipate the heat, allowing the light side to be cooler and the dark side to be warmer. This will allow the temperature to be mild enough for life to have much more habitable space. So Nusku will have a thick atmosphere. The planet's radius and mass suggest a composition similar to Earth, except with a potentially larger iron core. A large iron core means a strong magnetic field, which is good news for life. This planet will have active tectonics, with the continental shift looking something like this.
I will make more detailed maps of certain time periods in the future. In our fictional system, the second habitable world, Trappist-1F, will be named Mazu, after the Chinese goddess of the sea. Trappist-1F's density is a lot less than Earth's, leading some scientists to speculate that it could be a water world. The idea of a tidally locked water world seems interesting, so Mazu will be a water world just like its Trappist counterpart. However, we will have to bump up the mass once again. Mazu will have comparable properties to Earth, except with six times the amount of water. The average depth of Mazu's oceans will be around 20 to 22 kilometers. So deep that the deepest parts of Mazu's seas will be under such immense pressure that the water will become solid. Mazu's pure ocean ecosystem has potential for some truly unique and bizarre beasts. The furthest habitable planet from the star is Trappist-1G. Trappist-1G is the only habitable planet in the system that has a higher gravitational force than Earth. Just slightly more, at 105%. The mass is 1.34 times Earth, and its radius is 1.27 times Earth. Our system's third habitable planet will retain these properties. We will name it Uller, after the Norse god associated with winter sports. This planet will not be at all similar to the other two habitable planets. For one, it will be a lot colder and have a lot less water. But it will also be the only planet to have a day-night cycle. We are going to give Uller a moon, and a very large one at that. We will call it Lilla, after one of the Norse gods' shrines. It will have roughly the same mass of Earth, however, the radius will be about 0.85 times Earth radii, meaning it will be a lot more dense than Uller. Lilla's large size means that Uller will be tidally locked to its moon, rather than to its star. The moon also won't really be a moon, as the two bodies could be described as orbiting each other. So going forward, we will refer to Lilla and Uller as twin planets. Trappist-1H is too far away to be in the habitable zone. And 6 is a nice even number, so we will take this one out and replace it with an asteroid belt. We will be keeping track of what is happening on each of these three worlds with a timeline. It won't start at the beginning of the solar system itself, but rather at the occurrence of an important event in this system's history. Maybe, in a chance event, a rogue planet enters the system. A rogue planet is a planet that has no home star and travels the universe alone. In all likelihood, it did have a home star at one point, but it was ejected for one reason or another. When rogue planets come near star systems, they usually don't affect much, exiting the system just as quickly as they entered. But perhaps in our fictional system, the rogue planet, which we will name Eden after the biblical garden, passes extremely close to Mazu the second habitable world in our system. Eden is rather small, so it will likely not have much of an effect on Mazu's orbit. However, Eden will be crucial to another aspect of not only Mazu's history, but the history of the system in general. Eden will bring life to this dead world. Perhaps, during its close pass of Mazu, an impact or some other event transfers some living organisms from Eden to Mazu. This idea is known as transpermia, where microorganisms can travel between planets in one way or another. After this event, Eden will exit the Rosea system, never to return again. But Eden's impact on the Rosea system will be huge. Perhaps, over time, impacts on Mazu will kick up more debris that could make it over to the other planets. We know that this is possible because in the past, rocks from Mars have been discovered on Earth. If these debris happen to contain some tiny microscopic organisms, there is a slight chance that life from Mazu spreads to the other habitable planets. Perhaps Nusku is the second to gain life, seven million years after the encounter with Eden. Uller will follow suit eight million years later. Understand that the chances of all of these events happening at the same time is nearly impossible. But the purpose of this series is not necessarily to be 100% realistic, but rather to consider and explore life around a red dwarf with some scientific accuracy. Thank you all for watching.